Well, tonight we're going to be continuing on our journey through the Psalms, and we've been on this quest to uncover the deep mysteries of our faith that are woven into our songs of worship. And when Aaron and I charted this course that we set out a few weeks ago, it was our hope that when we went through these psalms that we would just find a new place for inspiration for us to discover how to sing a new song, how to sing the old song in a new way so that it fit within our context, allowing us to bring hope and light into our ordinary lives. But when we put this series together, we, would had, we had no idea about what was going to unfold in Charleston, Virginia, and it just has seemed completely orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, to be honest with you, that when we chose these psalms that we wanted to preach on weeks past, that somehow God knew we would need to hear a word for today in these ancient words. Our psalm for tonight is going to be number 63. We're not going in any particular order. We picked ones that we wanted to preach on, and so I love Psalm 63, which is why I chose it for no other reason quite literally. Um, it's been a catalyst for tremendous healing in my own life, and it's been a source of inspiration for a number of songs that I've written a couple years back. Having said that, I'm not going to preach on my journey of healing that was sparked by this particular psalm. If you want to hear that story, it's online. I preached a sermon about it for the woman in the well. I was in character. It was past spring. Go find it. Um, that will give you that aspect of my story. But we're going to go a totally different direction tonight. Um, we're going to be ex looking at this psalm and exploring the example that it offers us for how to find refuge when we are facing times of trial and specifically terror. And so if you would like to read along with me, it is printed in your bulletin. But hear now the word of God from Psalm 63. A psalm of David when he was in the Judean desert. God, my God, it's you I search for. My whole being thirsts for you. My body desires you in a dry and tired land, no water anywhere. Yes, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've seen your power and glory. My lips praise you because your faithful love is better than life itself. So I will bless you as long as I'm alive. I will lift up my hands in your name. I'm fully satisfied with a rich dinner. My mouth speaks praise with joy on my lips. Whenever I ponder you on my bed, whenever I meditate on you in the middle of the night, because you have been a help to me, and I shout for joy in the protection of your wings, my whole being clings to you. Your strong hand upholds me. What about those people who want to destroy me? Let them go down into the bowels of the earth. Let their blood flow by the sword. Let them be food for wild jackals. But the king should rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by God should give praise when the mouths of liars are shut up for good, or shut for good. The word for God, of God for us, the people of God, and God's people say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God of refuge and love, pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us gathered here so that as the scripture has been read and your word is now proclaimed, we may each hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I'm always fascinated to learn the story behind the songs that are written, behind the lyrics. It gives an entirely new perspective for me on what the song means and whatever I thought it meant. It just opens a whole new world for me. And so I went digging about Psalm 23 to find out what I could on the backstory of this. So here's what I learned. For starters, King David is the author. That's what most theologians believe. And it's based on the reference in the start of his psalm and what scripture tells us about David's time in the Judean desert. Most theologians pinpoint this in 1 Samuel, in chapter 23 and 24, as the time frame during his life that he would have written that. Now, if you go searching there, you're going to discover that at that time, David had fled into the desert because Saul's of wrath. God had removed Saul as being king because Saul had failed to honor God and was leading Israel and the people of God into idolatry. And so uh, King David had been anointed to be the new king, and Saul was not happy about it. So we find 
David literally running for his life in the Judean desert, all alone. So when he's crying out that his whole being is thirsty and hungry and he is in a dry land and he feels like he's going to faint, it wasn't just spiritual. It was literal for him. And as I pondered this passage, it reminded me of a time when I was in Israel quite a while ago um, and I was visiting the Judean desert Part of our journey that day took us to this place where we were kind of in this flat terrain. There wasn't much out there except for some rocky hills, just huge rocks that were forming these hills off in the distance. Not much to look at, nothing that seemed like it was going to be an inspiring adventure. And it was really hot that day. And so when our family arrived at this location and we were told, you know, you can just hike up this path and go up into the hills, I wasn't feeling very well that day myself. I don't remember why, but I just wasn't. I was probably dehydrated. I was feeling dizzy, slightly nauseous. But I put my big girl pants on for the sake of the fact that we were in Israel, and how often are you in Israel? And I was there with my family, and so off we went to hike up this hill in the middle of nowhere. And there was very little tree coverage, a little bit, but not much, really sparse trees. And as we started to approach the incline, I seriously was regretting my decision to not just stay in the car with the air conditioning running. But we kept going. I put one foot in front of the other. And as we approached these large boulders um, in this incline, there was an unexpected surprise. I hadn't really paid attention to what they had said about this trail. I was just kind of out of it. And so I was really surprised that there were these large cracks in these boulders. And rather than going over them, we were going to go through them. So as we journeyed in, the sun was no longer beating down on me, and I already started to feel better. And we kept journeying inward. And when we got to the center, as we were getting there, we were seeing these caves along the way, small caves. And then we got to the center, and there was this larger cave area. And there was this natural spring of water bubbling up out of the ground, creating this pool that was just clear and cool. And there was this rock formation as part of the cave that just kind of jutted out as a cleft, like a wing. And it was shaded, and it was cool, and we just rested there for a while. I would have loved to stay there the whole day. I, was, I found my happy place. Let's just stay here. <laughs> Some people believe or say that those might have been some of the caves that David camped out in when he was journeying and running from Saul. And some even have ventured to say that that might have been where he wrote this psalm. Um, when, you, when I sat there, I could certainly see how it in, would inspire some creative reflection. And that day, um, I, I was thinking about, and as I was writing this sermon, I was just envisioning, remembering what that looked like for David to sit at those cool waters with that cleft coming out over him. And to just being reminded of his time worshiping in the temple when he felt safe in God's presence with him. And then deciding to offer praise and create a sanctuary right where he was, even as he knew Saul was coming after him. And so under that cleft, I could just see David, the worshiper at heart that he truly was, just lifting his hands and singing or even shouting God's praise until God's presence simply consumed him to the point that he felt nourished in every possible way. So here's what I want you to do as I spend all this time imagining what was happening for David. I would like you all, if you're willing, to close your eyes and to allow me to read this psalm to you again, but this time I'm going to read it from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in the message, just so the words hit you a little differently. But imagine all that backstory. Imagine your own backstory. And now hear these words. God, you are my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up such hunger and thirst for God, traveling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim with praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. 
I eat my fill of prime rib and gravy. I smack my lips. It's time to shout praises. If I'm sleepless at midnight, I spend the hours in grateful reflection because you've always stood up for me. I'm free to run and play. I hold on to you for dear life, and you hold me steady as a post. Those who are out to get me are marked for doom, marked for death, bound for hell. They'll die violent deaths. Jackals will tear them limb from limb, but the king is glad in God. His true friends spread the joy with small-minded gossips are gagged for good. So how did that feel? Was it refreshing in an unexpected way? We've all been there at some point. I'm confident of it. You don't even have to have been on the earth for more than probably 10 years to have experienced some of the pain and anguish that brings us to that place in our life where we are tired and weary not just tired where a nap is going to take care of it, but the kind of tired and weary that makes your bones ache. And fear seems to be crouching in on every side of us, and we feel like there is nowhere to run, and the life within us is just drying up. And the gift of this psalm is that it gives us an idea of how we can be nourished in the midst of all of that. It's a reminder that in all times, in all places, whether we're in a desert or literally have caves of springs to retreat to or not, no matter where we are in the good and in the bad, we can create a space of refuge by simply being willing to praise God. I needed that kind of sanctuary these past couple weeks as we've witnessed the evil of neo-Nazism and bigotry rise up in our own country. And I needed it because I am a Jew whose family was carted off from Poland to concentration camps in Germany. And only a handful of them survived. And those who did met up in Germany where my father was born after World War II ended. And I am the first generation born here in America. And so to hear the echoes of rhetoric that led to the Holocaust brewing again has been a hauntingly fear-inducing experience for me. And yet, like my family decades ago, I've become keenly aware all of a sudden that there is really nowhere to run. There is nowhere to hide. From the time that I began following God's call, I've shared who I am. And so thousands of people know I'm a Jew. There's no hiding. There's no hiding my kids. And yet having said that, I've also been keenly aware over the last week and a half or so that our response to hatred and evil is critical if I allow those hateful actions and those words to seep into my soul, then I will become imprisoned by fear without them having to do anything. And that would mean that the alt-right would have already won, and I refuse to let that happen. Which is why I'm grateful for services like this and our Sunday morning worship opportunities, and our off opportunities that we have throughout the week to just gather together as God's people, to praise God, to pray to God, to sing God's praises. However it is that we are lifting the holy name of Jesus up, we are doing it together. And because of that, every time I have worshiped over the last few weeks, it's like I've been able to press pause on the influx of ne negativity and all of that hatred and evil that's spewing in our media right now. It's like all of that noise, that pshhh that goes on in our world. When I am in worship, it's like it gets muted. And so I am convinced that praise 
is one of the great mysteries and gifts of our faith. It's a place where fear literally can and will disappear in the presence of God, and peace can wash over us. Somehow, I don't know how it works. I don't need to know how it works, but I know that when we choose to praise God, even in the face of great hardship or darkness and evil, we somehow create a channel for God's resurrection hope to literally be poured into us and power and strength and love nourishes us from the inside outward so that we don't have to live in fear or be consumed by the same evil. And worship renews our mind. It helps change our perspective. So when we have more questions than answers, we can turn to the truth that we know we can cling to. Christ died and rose from the grave, not so we would waste away in some desert or be trapped and imprisoned because of terror in our world, but so that we could live life abundantly and fully filled with joy and peace, even in the face of great darkness and trials. And I know that each and every one of you get that. I know you get it because you're here. You've taken time out of your busy week to press the pause button, to let everything else in the world just keep going so you can find some safe refuge for your soul. And this space, this beautiful chapel space, while it may not be a cave with a wing coming out with a cleft, and it may not have a natural bubbling spring in the center of it. It is a place of refuge for many of us. It is a place and a source of living water where I and many of you experience God's presence in a very real and tangible way. Jesus once said, Come to me, all of you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Whether we're weighed down by health issues, financial challenges, or broken relationships, or maybe we're weighed down by all of the issues that plague our country and our world, or maybe it's a combination of all of that, as we choose to turn towards God, to lift up Jesus as our Lord and Savior, as we offer praise, even in the midst of the struggles and the storms, we can be confident that God is simply waiting there saying, yes, here is my opportunity to renew you and to restore you and to pour love and hope into you and to bring you a peace that you won't be able to explain, but it'll be so real that you can cling to it. And what's more, I believe that every time we gather to worship and we choose to praise God in the midst of all the other stuff, that we are literally waging war against the powers and principalities of evil that seek up to rise up and be against us. And I believe that that's precisely why Psalm 23 calls us to praise God even in the desert, to seek God more than anything else because God is better than life itself. God is life itself. And the scriptures declare that our praise literally unleashes God's power to be at work within us and then to nourish and restore us to our true identity, which is to be made in God's image, to be vessels of love, that's who we are. The world tells us we are something different. The world is wrong. Each and every human being was created to love and to be loved by God, by others, and by themselves. More and more of us need to cling tightly to who God is so that we know who we are. And when we do that, when we are at our lowest point, God says the story is not over. 
We always can choose whether we're going to cultivate more evil and darkness or empower God through our praise. And so in every moment, we have an opportunity to choose praise over revenge and to invite life and hope and faith and love to fill up the empty spaces within us and do so in a way that just overflows out of us so that just maybe others can experience a love they have never seen before and be changed. I am confident that each and every one of you are here because you know this is a place where you find renewal. And even knowing that you are people of worship and praise, I am going to invite you this week to intentionally take time to praise God. And I'm going to go a step further than just saying, go sing a song that you like. I'm going to intentionally invite you to get out of our Methodist mold and to actually, if you need to do this in your home where no one else is watching, that is fine. But I'm going to invite you to shout or sing a song that comes to you, that inspires you at the top of your lungs with your hands lifted up. And you're going to do it not just to be nourished, but you are going to do it to wage war against anything that would come against love. And so that you will be so filled with God's love and light and hope that the only thing you can do is allow that to consume you and to overflow out of you. And this, my friends, is the refuge that everyone seeks. Those that are filled with hate right now are also filled with fear. And they need love and light and hope just like we do. Let us be a refuge for others by being people who offer praise at all times, in all circumstances. If you're willing to do it, will you say amen? All right, we're going to move into our offering time now, and I'm going to actually switch off of this mic, so. Our offering time is an opportunity for us to give back to God out of the resources that he gives to us. And it's also a time for us to reflect on all of the ways that God gives us gifts and time and talents. And to use those in ways that glorify God and make us agents of change in the world. The song that we're going to do is one that I wrote years ago based on Psalm 66. It's kind of a hybrid of Psalm 66 with Romans 12. Um, but I thought I would share it with you. Thank you. 